Great. How's life? Life is was okay till uh, AstraZeneca and clots started appearing. So we've had a bit of a just had about three one hourly meetings with various populations trying to convince them that it's, uh, you know the vaccinations are generally still safe. But yeah, been a bit tricky. <laughs> yeah very 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 tra very challenging yeah um yeah it's a lot of questions been asked a lot of uncertainty and nervousness around people patients and probably highlighted by the media and the press sort of exaggerating the sort of the, the prevalence of these sort of serious side effects that's it exactly um yeah i was still giving vaccinations to under 30s today or follow-up vaccinations for the astrazeneca with no problem but yeah it's it's difficult um, I, I sympathise with them, but it's it's the problem is with these things. If one vaccination gets a challenge, then everyone says, "Oh, maybe not take any vaccination at all," and then it mm. becomes difficult. Then we're back to where we started. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's absolutely brilliant to welcome you back. Thanks so much. I was going to keep this fairly informal, and I don't know how you wanted to run the session. I was thinking we could do a quick recap on what we covered last week, just to really help drill drill in some of the learning um and then perhaps we could do a couple of quite straightforward cases that you could present to us that where we might utilize the request or the reading of blood tests yeah sounds good great um so um our first thing we want to talk about was um fbc so full blood count now what are we going to really look for in the full blood count are we really going to look for the hemoglobin now what what are we going to be really concerned about it when we look at the hemoglobin? So with the hemoglobin, the, the key, remember, everyone, is you guys are working hard with these patients. They want to be active. They want to be able to move their muscles around. Um, so having low levels of hemoglobin is going to be an issue. Uh, so make sure those hemoglobin levels are good. They're relatively normally between 11 and 14. So therefore, if they've got a hemoglobin of six, for example, they're not going to be, you know, stretching any leg or lifting any arm because they're going to be so knackered um, so it's important to to look at that um, and within that fcb so hemoglobin is one aspect of it remember infections so the white blood cells um, is, is an important factor you want to make sure there's no infections there um, uh, we did briefly mention that there is this thing called ethnic neutropenia so if the level of the white cell is low um, it could be just because of their race but otherwise you're looking for high infection rates um, platelets is also in there, which was important. Remember, that's an inflammatory marker. So obviously, we know platelets arrive at places where there's a cut and platelets arrive initially to stabilize the wound. But when platelets are up, it gives us an indication, could there be something else going on? So if you ever pick up a raised platelet or a high platelet, and this is normally in the range of 150 to 400. So if you're having platelets above 400, please go to your to, you know, primary care physician or nurse and just mention, oh, just picked up a raised platelet there. Um, you know, if, if they're on the ball as a doctor, they should be saying, oh, gosh, could it be a, a, one of these fancy cancers now that we're terming called Lego C, so lung, um, it's, uh, endometrial, gastric, esophageal, uh, and colorectal, Lego C cancers, if you just want to be really clever and, and nudge your GP. Um, but yeah, so that's the normally the full blood count that we look for. So just to recap, we're looking at hemoglobin. We're going to be concerned if it's low because that's obviously meaning, you know, you're not getting the oxygen around and it's a sign of sort of more serious underlying sort of disease, isn't it? Uh, and, and and age is it is it or is it is it just general I mean, I know it's related to to, to, to all sorts of conditions. Um and then we're looking at white blood cell count. So a white cell count. So that's going to indicate uh, if it's elevated, that's obviously going to be a sign that they might have an infection. Yeah. Um, and in your in your line of work, I guess, hopefully it shouldn't get to that stage, but septic arthritis, for example, you expect the white cell count to have gone up by then. Uh, and those people who have septic arthritis who are admitted into hospital, part of the monitoring is watching the white cells, which were raised, going down as they're being treated. Yeah, that's good to know because septic arthritis is quite a serious red flag if we suspect it. So looking at those bloods is a very good sign that that's probably not the situation or not what's happening, isn't it? Correct. Exactly. If, for example, say yesterday, 
they had a blood test and they're coming to see you and they're not weight bearing and you think, oh, it's a bit warm that joint. Actually, if you've looked at the quick blood test yesterday and the blood test is fine, it's probably mm. unlikely that they have septic ulcer because you would have really seen a change on that. Yes. Um, so neutrophils are elevated can also indicate septic arthritis. Is that right? And, and a bacterial infection or a UTI? Correct, 100%. So you've got the white cell, which is like the umbrella. And within that, you've got portions. So one portion is the neutrophil that gives an indication of the bacterial side. And the other bit we spoke about was that lymphocyte part, the viral potentially. So COVID, we've seen a lot of that raised. A common thing that I see raised viral for is EBV or uh, uh, um, kissing disease, um, we mm. call it. So uh, laryngitis. So you can get, um, if there's viral infections, so flu even can raise that um, uh, lymphocyte marker up. Platelet count elevated, be concerned, speak to the GP, get a second opinion. If we spot it, it's obviously needs to be looked at normal range, 150 to 400, but anything over that up towards 700 to alarm bells. Yep. Just remember that if they come, say you're following them up for um, knee op, for example, so you're doing the rehab for knee operations, Remember, after they come out of an operation, because you'd assume a lot of inflammation, a lot of platelets have been at that site, it could be raised there. So you don't have to get alarmed then. So if you're seeing them for follow-up, don't worry too much then. This is one of those, you know, I've sent it over to say, Tim, um, you know, someone's got frozen shoulder, they need some help with that. I send it over to Tim, haven't had any operations recently. And then for some reason, they've looked, you've looked at the blood test and the platelets are raised. You should al alert that. If they're junior doctors to, to, to support them, it, it is a kind of a new, it's not a new concept. We've always been aware that it could be an issue, but this idea of the legacy, it's something I'm telling you that's probably a little bit above and not all clinicians will um, know about it, but it's something that we should. And now let's, what about, let's move on to the, the urea and electrolytes then. So when would we typically request i mean how 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 normal is it to request uh unis uh, use these and is, is is it done routinely or do we look for specific reasons why we might request that so so using these are a very i mean when we, when I, someone comes and says i need my routine bloods full blood count use these and lfts are really really common we add sometimes a few others thyroid and things like that but use these and lfts are almost standard fare you would always add that on and particularly in your line of work, you know, can imagine some of the anti-inflammatories that people are on, some of these eight-year-olds who are on ibuprofen and naproxen for many, many years without any monitoring, they could have had a blood test done and they could actually have an element of kidney failure. Uh, and we talk about kidney failure, looking at the quality, uh, type term known as creatinine. And this is normally raised in failure or something called EGFR, which you may see as well, which goes lower, it goes under 60, the more and more you have failure. Just to put that into context, you should have EGFR, so I hope everyone here has an EGFR of above 60, but if you have it below 15 due to failure, due to various causes, dehydration, anti-inflammatories, um, any form of poisonous medication, if you go below 15, unfortunately, that puts you in dialysis. You would actually have to have dialysis every day or every few days. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the best ways to check kidney health is really just looking at normal levels of elevate uh, of, of creatine, normal levels of EGFR, glomerular filtration rate. If GFR goes down, then obviously kidney function is reduced. If creatinine goes up, kidney function is reduced. And so elevated creatinine or a a, 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 a reduction in GFR below outside of a normal range would be a good sign that um, the kidney is not functioning particularly healthily. Correct, exactly. And th these elderly patients that we have, as we get older, that function we expect to deteriorate. So the coconut milk is not right because it just came out really oily and gross at the bottom. So just watch that. I'll just see if I can mute Joe. Joe, yeah, if you can just... No, 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 no. Hey, Joe. Oh. That's right. It's lovely hearing about your coconut milk. But, um, <laughs> That's good. We're, 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 on, uh, we're on creatinine at the moment. <laughs> we'll get to coconut milk shortly. Co coconut milk's up next. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so just remember, as we get older, don't be alarmed that, you know, if you're over 80 and you've got a fantastic kidney function, good for you. But most people, as we get 
older, it will start to drop anyway. So just be cautious. But it's really the anti-inflammatories. If you see, you know, doctor, you know, they're taking huge amounts, do alert um, the GP that, oh, good, you're probably, they're getting, you know, anti-inflammatories from somewhere and probably killing their kidney because that's not right. <laughs> we should be doing something about that. Yeah, and it's it's easy to forget because we all know about the sort of harmful effects of anti-inflammatories on the stomach and reflux and um, and the risk of stomach bleeds. But we also there's other negative effects that anti-inflammatories have, and and kidney kidney is just one area that seems to be negatively affected. Correct. Now, liver function tests. Now, how routinely is is liver function test or LFT? Uh, te- how fre- frequently is this done? So this again is part of our routine screen um, in application for you guys. The summary that what we talked about last time was this idea that you have the ALTs or the ASTs, the ones with the T at the end. Um, so um, they, they're called transaminases. And it's always important if you see T, that's saying the actual liver itself, something's going on with that. So sometimes like a hepatitis, so which is a liver disease, a, a liver infection, um, cirrhosis through alcohol, for example, so if you drink excessive amounts of alcohol, ALT rises. If you have a lot of fat on your liver, we call fatty liver, ALT rises, that's within the liver. But if you see the other function, which is ALP, phosphatase, ALP, that's talking about the outside. Now, when I mean outside, I mean things that can put pressure on the liver. So the gallbladder is there, the pancreas is there. So if you ever saw those, the ALP risen, you sometimes question, oh, is could, I'm not saying there is, but could there be a pancreatic cancer pushing on the liver? Could there be gallstones pushing on the liver? So whenever I see a raised ALP, I normally always like to repeat blood tests because unfortunately you can get abnormal blood tests that are just, you know, the computer messes up. Always get a quick repeat one, unless you're very confident that this is definitely something wrong, but also look for trend. So if it's a further deterioration, so if you're seeing a higher level of these, so um, in terms of why you guys would see it, people on methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and, and certain um, medications can damage the liver and have an effect on this. Um, alcohol, you know, I'm not sure how often you see patients who are alcoholics, but alcohol will cause da- damage to that, to that area as well. Um, so, so yeah, that's when you guys would see it. And um, what was there a damage? Yeah, no, those were the ones we were talking about, yeah. So essentially elevated ALT, uh, which is inside a liver, elevated um, ALP, which is outside of a liver, like something pressing on a liver, like gallstones or pancreatic cancer or some sort of mass pushing on liver. If they're elevated, then we're going to be concerned for the function of the liver. Correct. Um, one other thing for ALP, guys, which you guys will come across. Interestingly, ALP also rises when bone formation occurs. So you see an acute rise when you have a fracture, so you may be dealing with that. Um, if you guys do deal with children, all children's ALP will be risen, not because of their liver, but because of their bone, because they're growing. So as they grow, ALP rises. So this was something, this was actually as a doctor, first year as a doctor, I was I was doing a pediatric rotation, you used to see all these ALPs in panic, but actually no, this is normal. So if you're ever dealing with kids and you see blood test results, and you say, oh, ALP, that should be a liver function. Well, yes, it is a liver function. But in this case, at, like with lots of um, blood tests that we do, iron, platelets, there are uh, markers that can actually go up for the other reasons as well. So just watch out for the ALP as well. Now, if we suspect a patient um, might have symptoms, um, uh, that might question us to check the thyroid function and things like they, they might be putting on weight or getting dry hair or feeling very lethargic or tired or maybe they're they're, they're losing weight what kind of things would lead us to um to test for thyroid function yeah so the the idea of thyroid remember guys is it's a butterfly shaped organ in the neck uh the way i always describe is like a duracell battery so the best way you don't need to go to medical school you just need to understand how a battery works If the battery is low, think your body is low. So everything's very sluggish. You start to gain weight because everything works slower. Your heart rate is slower. Your skin is dry. Your hair is dry and starts falling out. Your period cycles goes off. You become constipated. You're very, very tired. You can just picture that like what a low battery charge person would be. And that's what your thyroid person is. It's the metabolism that's not quite there. Flip it around, the battery is highly charged. You charge it for hours and hours. 
How does that work? You're very anxious, you're shaky, trembly, um, your eyes are really bright and popping out, your heart rate is beating very quickly, you're having diarrhea because the bowels are working quickly, you just want to eat more and more to try and eat, um, the skin can be very oily so you, and then sweaty. So already again, you can quite see how that, that works with the, the, the other side. Um, so, so what I was mentioning to you guys and Tim last time was in, in, in your line of work, things like polymagia rheumatica um, is, is commonly where they get muscle aches in, in obviously in their shoulders and lifting. Uh, and an interesting thing is um, with thyroid, they get a lot of this what we call girdle pain or a restriction. So I ask a lot of my patients who have hypothyroid, low thyroid, can you get out of your chair without using your hands? And they wouldn't be able to do that. So if you ever notice some of your patients, you've been doing physio with them for a while and you're just not quite getting, you need to get their upper thighs working better, but you just can't get that sorted. Worth getting a blood test for the thyroid because if they've got low thyroid, maybe that's debilitating them to stop them doing the, the good work you guys are trying to do. Perfect, good. So we often see thyroid function related to musculoskeletal conditions. You know, I, I've got a patient at the moment that's struggling with, she seems to have a lot of tendinopathies. She has ankle pain, she has wrist pain, she has um, a, a right hip pain, she has back ache, you know, but she also isn't, really struggles with maintaining her thyroid function. You know, and it's hard to tell, isn't it, sometimes, you know, what exactly is going on. I, I kind of know she's not injuring all these areas. So I keep saying to them, there's something clearly going on here. I don't think it's that you've strained one wrist and strained the other wrist and strained your elbow. But thyroid function is quite related to musculoskeletal problems, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's the way you should think about thyroid is it's in metabolism. It's in every, it's what we call the hemiostasis of the body. It's, it's in every single thing. Hence why it has such an impact on mood, skin, bowels, period cycles, eyes, it's in every intricate cell in the body. So therefore, if that's off or not in shape, you're not going to get anywhere with them. Sadly, you know, anything you do is like, you know, sticking a plaster on it and it, and it falling down. You need to get the baseline sorted. It's similarly how things like rheumatoid arthritis. Sadly, there are cases and I picked a couple of up where we blindly just sent them to physio, blindly just tried to give them a bit of steroid here and there. And they've actually got this underlying condition, rheumatoid arthritis, which, yes, it is a joint condition, but it actually affects the whole body. And we've just been trying to do bits and bobs, but actually we haven't gone to the under, underlying. You find out they've got rheumatoid, you treat the rheumatoid with something like methotrexate. They then come into the physio and for those areas that were trickier, now you're seeing some great response. So really important if, you know, the, you know physio should really, if it's a musculoskeletal problem, you guys should be absolutely smashing it in, in that area. It shouldn't be an issue. If you are struggling over a period of time, don't feel afraid to chase it back with us. Just go, look, you've tried everything. Something may be deeper. We've scanned, nothing too obvious on there. But if, if you're struggling, do chase it back. And if you can find some extra problems they've mentioned, my appetite's off or just not opening my bowels as much. There's something else added. It's probably not a musculoskeletal. There's something deeper probably going on. And if you suspect rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, what are our options in primary care? So would we first of all refer for bloods and what would we, what would we? Sorry, Tim, I just lost you on that last bit, but I think you were just asking what we do for chasing rheumatoid. So for rheumatoid arthritis, um, the simple thing is we definitely have to do blood tests. We do full, when anyone complains of joint take and muscle pains and things like that, we always do the full screen, obviously, as we've already discussed the routine blood test we would do. But then on top of that, we would do our vitamin screen because actually simple things like vitamin D, low IN could also cause an issue. But the rheumatoid blood test, as we say, is something called rheumatoid factor, which makes sense, but also something called anti-CCP. The reason why we don't just go on rheumatoid factor is we have rheumatoid arthritis patients that are rheumatoid factor negative, strangely, and vice versa but anti-CCP, a more of an expensive blood test, but gives you a more um, correct diagnosis for rheumatoid arthritis, we would get that. So in primary care, yes, we would get those, all of those done first. So when we're actually sending to the rheumatologist, we're pretty sure there's um, something rheumatoid arthritis going on. Remember, there are these weird and wonderful conditions, which I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, things like Sjogren's, um, these are strange conditions which are all considered rheumatological, 
Um, but we pick these up by even fancier tests. These are tests called um, anti-nuclear tests, so ANA and ANCA and PANCA. You don't need to go into all of those, but rheumatoid is a very interesting condition. It, it, it can fluctuate a flu blood cells, but for, for, the, for this teaching, really what you need to do is rheumatoid factor, you need to get your anti-CCP, which is a really yes, no to rheumatoid arthritis, ESR and CRP, which as you know, are the inflammatory markers, and just a quick range of vitamins, just to make sure that's not exacerbating things. And um, let's talk a little bit about, more about CRP and ESR, because I think that's quite relevant to, to MSK, isn't it? Because we often see patients coming in with multiple joint aches and pains. They can often be female um, of a particular age and seniority in life, especially over 50s, over 60s. You know, they, they typically have bilateral pains in multiple joints. You know, and so we're, we're sort of straight away thinking things like polymyalgia, rheumatica. Absolutely. Yeah. So ESR, CRP, really good blood test to have. Just remember that with ESR, you punch someone in the arm, you're pregnant, you go for a run, you fall over. Any of those, ESR goes up. DVT, cancer, it goes up. So it's not specific. So with polymyalgia rheumatica, I do it definitely because actually if someone's saying they can't lift their arms, both their arms above. So a recent lady I had, she booked in to want to have steroid injections with me and she booked in a telephone consultation initially as I'll speak to her. She said, oh, it's both her arms. And I said, well, I'm happy to steroid joint both your arms, but it's a bit unusual. I'd actually think, has there something else going on? And then when you kind of asked them to do the lift, she was unable to do it. So we then did the blood test to check for ESI and it was 70, very, very high. It should be under 12. So definitely PMR there. Started on steroids and usual story with all these patients. They're hugely, hugely grateful. It makes an immediate impact within two days. They've probably been suffering with this for a while. And polymyalgia falls under the rheumatological conditions where it's not just a joint problem. They actually have severe associated tiredness. And one thing we worry about, why we panic and treat very quickly in general practice, is it's linked to something called GCA, giant cell arthritis, which is an inflammation of the site of the temple, uh, the temporal artery, the side of your head, and potentially can cause blindness. Now, that's not to scale to say everyone PMR gets that, but that's how we act. That's why we act so quickly with these cases. And we start steroids. And again, for you guys, I know there has been doctors who've actually, I know one of my colleagues in my practice had actually sent a PMR without realizing to James, our physio, um, from uh, Surrey Physio, um, but within two days, we got a blood test. Back. So we kind of lazily just said, oh, speak to the physio, they'll get it sorted, all done and dusted. But in that time, within two days, we got the results saying it's a raised ESR. So we reined it back because there's no point, James, trying to even attempt as much as he could try. It's going to be a wasted effort. We start on the steroids. That in itself, we think we'll do it. But if it doesn't, we will obviously then refer back. And we're really looking at... Um prednisolone aren't we to kind of dampen that inflammatory response aren't we so it's, it's the body is creating this over over inflammatory reaction which is creating this joint inflammation joint pain and then we'll prescribe prednisolone um, and and how i mean how do you know what how much to prescribe i mean you know do we do, is, is it 10 milligrams is it is it is it 15 milligrams? Do you start people off on smaller amounts and build it up or start people off on bigger amounts and, 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 and reduce it? Yeah, great question, Tim. It's, uh, it, one thing you guys have to get uh, understand, it, it's something called autoimmunity, and that's the idea of our own body. You know, a lot of the conditions, asthma, for example, or COPD, which you'll see a lot of, some of the skin condition, dermatitis, eczema, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, polymyalgia, these are conditions surprising is your own body is attacking those areas so in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis it's your own body attacking your bowel in asthma it's your own body attacking um, the, the lungs and what's fascinating is what is the treatment in all what's linked to all of these conditions polymyalgia as well steroids what does steroids do it dampens as Tim was saying it dampens the response it tells your body guys chill out don't come and attack here we're fine because it's that over response or that hypersensitivity now, this concept of hypersensitivity, I commonly use because it's it can be um, increased. So asthma, for example, why do some people get asthma attacks when they're nervous and stressed? Is because when your immunity or your way of fighting calms down, 
it stresses out and then it kicks off these reactions. So things like polymyalgia, things, certain conditions can actually flare after stressful episodes. But the way the answer to do it is to try and drop, uh, tr try and dampen the area down. And we do this with steroids. Now, yes, prednisolone is the one. That's the one we use in this country. Good question of what dose. It varies about con confidence of clinician. If you asked me 15 years ago, I would have said, oh, we'll give 20 milligrams. So these are five milligram tablets. Give four a day for a week or two. And, and that's it, which is, you know, just like throwing it in the bin. You've got to be more confident. And it comes with practice and it comes with seeing the results and the impact. So someone with polymyalgia rheumatica, the one I've got at the moment, which I gave to last week, I gave eight tablets, eight times five, 40 milligram doses. And I give that, I gave that for a week. And what I do is I do the sliding scale. Sliding scale means you can't just suddenly drop steroids at high doses. So I gave 40 milligrams for a week, 35 for the next week, 30, 25, 20. So for eight weeks, they're just going down. And what it does, it, as it goes down, it allows the body to start producing and supporting the body to try and control that PMR. What you find sadly with PMR in a lot of cases, and this is where I struggle with, and we have a big problem is, is when a patient comes to you and they say the dramatic effect steroids do, because actually they do wonders for everywhere, except the fact they have their side effects, which we can talk about. People feel great. They're moving more, their joints are you know, um, more or less of a problem. You bring them down and the, the keenness of most people is take them off steroids because of some of the complications that can arise from long-term. But with PMR, I tend to lead them on a very low dose, maybe a five milligram dose daily for, for, many, for many, many months, potentially even a couple of years. The reason is when you fully take it off, they sometimes go back into that PMR flare. So it might be sensible just to keep them on that five milligram dose uh, to control the PMR. Great. Um, let's talk about the vitamins then. So vitamins, folate, ferritin, vitamin D. Um, how frequently do we look for things like that and how frequently do we test those things? All of the vitamins you just mentioned, folate, ferritin, B12, vitamin D, can all have muscle ache, joint pain as one of their problems. So it's actually really sensible to, you know, different doctors may argue, but I do that. Anyone with muscle ache, joint pain or tiredness, that's in my routine screen. B12, folate and ferritin sit on the red blood. So really important about the hemoglobin. So if ferritin goes down, hemoglobin goes down. Folate goes down, hemoglobin goes down. Um, B12 goes down, um, hemoglobin goes down. So that's where it's really important to actually check these because one, you're going to help with muscle ache and joint pains if you pick that up. And therefore, the work you do with that patient is going to be better. But also, um, if they're tired, you know, if as a result of these vitamins being low, if they're tired, you're not going to get much out of them. And you want them to be on top form uh, to, to perform. So for that reason, I would do that generally as a routine if they mention any kind of muscle ache, joint pain or tiredness. And vitamin D, surprisingly, I don't know if anyone's had vitamin D before, in, but in a lot of cases, whether it's placebo or not, it does make a significant difference if they're low. And we have varied doses. So we have some that are just 1,000 units a day, which you can buy over the counter, varying to, say, 20,000 units high doses that you can uh, take to bring those levels up. Yeah, I mean, my experience is that vit low vitamin D is very, very common and it makes a massive difference to people's joint pains and mood as well. And often they generally... I mean, I, I think you can see that when the sun comes out, you know, yeah. your mood tends to improve, doesn't it? And things yeah. tend to feel a bit better. Um, and, I, and I do relate that to vitamin D levels as well. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, that's a brilliant recap from um, from 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 last week, uh, from two weeks ago. Now, I was wondering whether we could maybe look at one or two case examples or maybe even whether we could bring up a dummy patient or a test patient and just talk us through you know practically talk us through where we might sort of spot some of these things like anti-ccps and and things like that um on sunquest or on dart or whatever whatever method we might use to 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 request bloods yeah absolutely should i give an example or does anyone have any you're welcome to chip in anyone i think there was a question tim wasn't there on practical question yeah. Chris, just before should we just answer that one yeah brilliant so practical um, question i can never find anti-ccp on emis where is it listed under uh so is, uh, sorry chris do you work in croydon chris is here i work in uh wandsworth 
Wandsworth, right. Because I work in Sutton and I work in Croydon. Both of ours, sometimes you can't type in the whole word anti-CCP. Just by typing anti, it should appear on there. Okay. But are you saying, as in EMIS, as in our app, are you saying when you request the blood or when yeah. you... Yeah, yeah. Just trying to try it for you now. It should, even if you type in anti, it should actually arise there. But I, I guess this probably depends on your CCG and how they do it. Um, but you should be able to credit. The only time where I think maybe not is sadly, which will be very frustrating, is if uh, ones that have a funding issue or have problems with it where they don't want you to request it. But um, especially in our areas, and we're part of the same big CCG, part of Southwest London, we can definitely, but I know in Croydon initially there was a time we struggled. It's because everyone typed in anti hyphen CCP, which is correct. It wouldn't search for some reason on that. You had to type in anti, and then it gave yeah. a few options and CCP was one of them. I've looked under um, the offline Test and it's not under hematology, biochemistry, biochemistry, additional microbiology or immunology. They've got RA screen and is it on there? Factor, but I can't see it. There's anti cardiolipin. Mm, I've just not, never been able to find it. On there. No, can you type in one other thing? Because the, the full name is the fancy name is anti cyclic. Yeah. Citronellate peptide. Um, can you do a search at all, or is it is it only what's offered there? No, it's just a tick box. Uh, that's a bit annoying, because that's the beauty about in Sutton and Croydon, we actually have a search. So you're right, in our normal rheumatoid screen, surprisingly, it doesn't have anti-CCP. I assume that's to avoid costs, because otherwise everyone would just be clicking on it, even the junior doctors would just be clicking. But you have to physically search. We have a search option, and that's where we type in the anti so that might be something that you may need to relate back to the gp to see how they do it in wandsworth sure good um tim should i run through an example or does anyone yeah anyone that, welcome to jump in if they have any cases that they think a bit confused about or yeah if you can start with start us oh, off yeah, maybe can... maybe everyone have a think um so let me run through an example and and maybe you guys can tell me what i should be doing next so i have a 42 year old who's been seeing me for the last eight weeks, and I'm seeing her every couple of weeks with joint pains. Um, when she describes it, it's in her elbows and her fingers. We've done all the blood tests and the vitamins have come back. Okay, vitamin D is a little bit low, but nothing major. Liver function is fine. Kidney function is fine. Vitamins, like I said, is, is okay. But the ESR is a little bit raised. It's raised in the, the range of about 25 and normal is about 12. She's very, very fit and well. She's a swimmer. Um, she does indulge in a little bit of wine every weekend, um, but otherwise very fit and healthy, but you know, just like socializing. Any ideas where we would go with that? We've done the initial kind of set of blood tests. Any ideas what we could do after that? Well, <clears throat> sorry, can I jump in? Of course you can, Alan. Uh, well, possibly uh, CRP, uh, yes. ANAS, uh, anti, uh, anti CCP, and RA factor. Yeah, good. You can definitely do that. Any other ones? I'll give you a clue. Um, it's about her indulging with the alcohol every weekend. Uric acid. Well done. Yeah. So this is one of these cases which I had, which I missed as well for the first few weeks because I thought she's female, she's athletic, um, but actually females, I'm picking up a lot of uric acid or high urate and a lot of gout in females. It's like I said last two weeks ago, remember the, the typical medical school way of learning is Henry VIII. So a large fat white individual drinking red wine, eating lots of meat. I've seen gout, sadly, in cases where people don't even drink that kind of level. And remember, the typical is the big toes, the red, hot to touch pick, uh, big toe that even the duvet can't even touch. But in this lady, the why I was a bit not quite picked it up is because I always, you know, even on a phone call when someone says, oh, my big toe is, I can almost stop them there and say, oh, I think this is going to be, you know, you can always predict it. But this was very interesting where it wasn't very obvious. There was no 
obvious joint. It was in the elbow, which of course gout can go to any joint, but it was just interesting how it didn't present the typical toe area and she wasn't your typical patient. So with gout, I'm doing a lot more uric acid, so just watch out for it. Um, could, could check you. Oh, well done, Libby. Yeah, so you, Libby got it. <laughs> Um, another one, again, this is something that we mentioned last week, but we haven't revised today. So it's probably a good place to start again, like, like with gal. Um, a young chap, a uh, 30 year old comes in saying he's quite restricted. He's been restricted in his back for a while. Uh, and I do an examination. He's relatively okay, but looks a bit stiff in the neck area. Um, his posture looks a little bit off as well. And then when I asked him to reach to, for his toes, expecting he's quite a slim chap, he should be able to reach. He doesn't, he can't reach it. He feels quite restricted with it. Yep, well done, Sue. Well done, Sue, yeah. Good, that was, that was quick. So someone's been listening. She gets the carrot. Um, yep, well done, Sue, that's it. Um, so, so we're looking for ankylosing spondylitis here. So uh, quite a few clues there. So a young male commonly and, uh, and, and that restriction there. So yeah, that, that, that's... To, and I mentioned last week, I think it was probably Alan or one of you guys had mentioned a couple of weeks back, oh, how often do we do ankylosing spondylitis? And, and I literally spoke to my colleague just now and he, we chatted, you know, we always do catch ups, you know, every day. So I, I mentioned two weeks ago, we'd spoken about, and he goes, oh gosh, we, we, we don't, we don't really look for that. And I said, yeah, these guys have brought it up and God honest truth, we picked up three now since two weeks ago, because you, you suddenly become honed on looking at it more. It's one of your options. It's like the urate, you know, gout. That week that I picked up the female gout, it's, you know, you start to, so it's not to say we're, we're rubbish, we don't always think about it, but it's so hard to think of every single condition of being, anyone who's restricted in the lower back, I mean, he could just have back pain as long as there's no red flags. Um, so it, it's quite nice sometimes, and that's why I love doing these sessions, because when we have this discussion as a group, it does, you know, somewhere in the back of our brain, it brings it back as a, a, a almost like a priority, because these things like PMR, for example, you could go months and months without picking it up and then suddenly hits you, but you've got to be proactive. They could be an elderly lady that, I mean, I saw, I saw we were doing the COVID home visit jabs today and the way through them open the door, I swear they probably have PMR, um, but you don't actively look for these things. But what's important is what a dramatic impact for that patient you can make if you really think outside the box. So, so yeah, that was the other option. That was the other case, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, Anyone else want to ask any cases or I'm happy to come up with another? Yeah, um, I'd like to ask something. Maybe you can come up with one more after that, uh, Levan, and then we'll break. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just check about osteoporosis. So, I mean, when we suspect osteoporosis, typically we would sort of, sort of probably refer them back to the GP and, or, or, you know, discuss with a GP, a DEXA scan. Is there any sort of blood, would we look for anything in, in the blood tests as well for which might lead us towards a diagnosis of osteoporosis? So no, yeah, again, good question, Tim. It, it doesn't actually know osteopro. So osteoarthritis X-rays really, but osteoporosis is purely done on a DEXA and what we call the T-score. Um, what can make it worse or make it trickier? Um, low vitamin D again can point that. So if you're picking up low vitamins, just because you think you're going to start osteoporosis medication, make sure the vitamin Ds are good so you can add that on. That's actually a good point to mention, Tim, because one thing I forgot to mention is when we we're talking about the steroids and the high doses, the problem with remaining on high dose steroids is the complications and sadly long-term use leads to things like diabetes, psychosis, cataracts, loss of hair, gaining weight, high blood pressure, um, and osteoporosis is sadly one of the problems. So I've got a lady at the moment who's a 60 year old who will still say I did the right thing, although I do feel guilty every so often, is where she had um, quite significant uh, COPD. So this is a, a problem with the, the lungs due to smoking, uh, as well as polymagia rheumatica. And we hit hard with steroids. She loved the steroids because her breathing was phenomenal. She, her arms were great and she just refused to get off it. And I just said, we've got to get you down, get you down. So we got her down as low as possible to the lowest possible level. And then she's been on it for years, five, six, seven years. And her bones have now gone osteoporotic. We weren't monitoring it as well as we should, which is our guilt. She then had a fall and had some significant spinal fractures. She still walks around and says, I don't care. Give me more steroids. I loved it. 
but it, it is that thing to watch out for. And, and it's one of the causes for osteoporosis. Early menopause is a cause of osteoporosis. So watch out for your females. The reason is estrogen is a protective factor. And so if you're on HRT, for example, not that we're encouraging all females to go on HRT, but I've got some of these lovely women who are in their 70s, 80s who are you know, fit and healthy. Um, and they, they, there's no risk of their spine getting you know, shrunk or curving in any way because the estrogen is protecting. Um, but yeah, Dexar scan is the way your, your three options are normally leave it well alone. You've got no osteoporosis or it's very mild. Second option is it's enough that you probably need to consider some. So these are the cases of osteopenia where, the, where there's a bit of a weakening. And then you give things like vitamin D and calcium. So these calcium tablets that you'll see. And then your third option is that you hit hard. And these are the boss, uh, biphosphonates. Um, and biphosphonates, are, you know, they're pretty hardcore. Um, you may know the way you take it is odd. You've got to wait an hour, empty stomach, um, can cause issues with teeth. So dentists have a bit of an issue with it. But they do try and encourage calcium to go and deposit back on the scaffolding of the bone. Yeah, brilliant. Um... Um, any questions, guys? I saw a few pop-ups from um, to, to Ellen. Did you want to, um, and, and Josh, did you want to just jump in? Um, hi. Um, my quick question was, um, so if you're looking at a patient with numbness, um, but no neurological symptoms, um, additional to 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 the numbness besides that so um you would not have any muscle weakness or um any sensory loss just the numbness uh besides the vitamin b12 and phosphate um not phosphate sorry uh folic uh acid is anything else that you would kind of look for in the blood test that's a good question sue yeah very good to ask that because that you'll see that a lot i just realized actually so yeah iron i would add on that nice and easy and actually iron itself can cause numbness so definitely and interesting diabetes as well yes normally with diabetes you get the full-on neurological symptoms but actually early diabetes that hasn't been picked up so um, I used to work in an area with a high Sri Lankan population in Norbury in Croydon and we had loads of them who were undiagnosed diabetics but were presenting to us with pure numbness just numbness in their legs everything else seemed okay and then we checked their HbA1c so the diabetic level and that would show um, but they were significantly diabetic. So absolutely agree with you. B12 folate, I would add on the ferritin, um, but I would also add on a sugar or what we call HbA1c. That's a good starter. All right, thank you. No and and Levan, can you just briefly talk about um, uh, blood sugar levels and HbA1c and over what time period that typically shows your blood sugar levels? Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, we didn't mention that. So HbA1c is a clever blood test because it, you don't have to be fasted, which traditionally you should check your glucose levels on a fasting and it would only give you a range of a day or two. But HbA1c is about the crystallization of the red blood. Now, the red blood lives for 120 days before it dies out. So the theory is every time you do a blood test for sugar, it's telling you right. So today, when I do a blood test for HbA1c, it tells me all the red blood that has been working for the last 120 days. So therefore, the next, if I do an initiation of a new medication today, there's no point me checking a blood test any earlier than another 120 days or another three months. Wait for the three months and then check again. So that's why sometimes checking bloods can be quite slow for diabetes to see progress, but it's because any intervention takes that long. And remember crystallization of the red blood, is, is sad because red blood goes everywhere, hence why we worry, because we talk about microscopic disadvantages or microscopic complications, and they're where we have blood vessel which are thin in the eye, so retinopathy, which can cause to blindness. Second, almost the first commonest cause of blindness in this country. Uh, re, uh, um, kidney, uh, kidney failure, where you can actually get nephropathy, so that's the blood vessels that supply the kidney, they can get um, uh, crystallized red blood, which can cause them, put them into renal failure. Common, one of the commonest causes of dialysis now is diabetes in this country. And then as Sue was mentioning about um, the feet, the neuralgia and, and um, uh, the numbness tingling that you can occur, that's by nerves. That's by the crystallization of the red blood being depositing on the nerves. And then you get that loss of sensation, uh, loss of power potentially, tingling sensation. It can even lead to male um, you know, erectile dysfunction. Quite a sad condition, so very important. And obviously your macroscopic, your 
bigger blood vessels, things like, um, which can cause complications like heart attacks and strokes. So you have your macro complications, stroke, to, uh, stroke and heart attacks, and your micro complications, which involve the eyes, kidneys, and nerves like your feet. I just have another question following on from that regarding um, diabetes screening. Is it the same test for um, type two and gestational diabetes? And is that something we should be thinking about when we see pregnant ladies come in with carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, carpal tunnel, good one, yeah. So carpal tunnel, uh, just to before I forget to talk about that, carpal tunnel commonest causes are obviously being overweight, diabetes and hypothyroidism and pregnancy. So all four very, very common. Absolutely, you can do the HbA1c test. We or the maternity team should be picking these up by sugar tests that they do at different stages or twice um, in the pregnancy stage. If they're high risk, they would check twice. If they're low risk, they'll just check once. But yeah, you're very welcome to check the HbA1c at that stage. And yeah, that will show a rise or an issue there. Sometimes we do fasting sugars, which can also be used at that level. But yeah, HbA1c's are fine to use in type one, type two and gestational. Uh, and in fact, after you've delivered the baby, sometimes monitoring, I normally do an annual HbA1c to make sure they haven't slipped into diabetes. Because sadly, if you are gestational diabetic, you have a chance potentially, if you don't look after yourself, to become diabetic at some point. Thank you. No problem. Um, Levan, question oh. from one of the, our colleagues. Um, bone profile. So, can you talk to us a little bit about how when when that might be done? Or is it is it commonly used? What might it show us? Um, yeah. So, bone profile is typically your calcium, your vitamin D, phosphate. Now, calcium and phosphate tend to be more diet related that we normally pick up on. Unfortunately, calcium obviously can be raised in cancers. Uh, metastatic disease unfortunately raises the calcium um, but yeah commonly we do this normally because when you type in vitamin d for any of your blood tests it naturally does a bone profile because it wants you to correlate to see so um, i don't particularly ever type in bone profile i just type in vitamin d but it will come up with with the calcium and, and vitamin d it, it only becomes an issue i guess when you're giving vitamin d for muscle ache, joint pains if they're very elderly or have kidney problems because sometimes the vitamin d can cause an issue with that but otherwise no it's it's absolutely fine brilliant um well if we just have maybe one one more question from from someone because i know it's um any any final questions from anybody um i just got a quick question um someone comes in with multiple joint pain um hands knees hips elbows um, not really specifically stiff in the morning and so on. What would be your sort of go-to screen? You don't want to, you know, always feel like you don't want to go and do a whole whack of tests, just, you know, trying to find something. What would be your sort of go-to test? Initial. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? Because, you, you know, I have a colleague, a partner who does, who probably in that case would do everything under the sun. Although now we understand, you know, because, you know, you have to accept that common things are common and, and still part of our job. What makes it interesting is that investigation process. Yeah, you shouldn't um, you don't want to keep bringing back patients and keep checking bloods doing more and more. But you can normally find things quite quickly. And I would say in that kind of case, if it's a general thing, common things are common would indicate to me it's, it's probably a vitamin deficiency. If it's an all round effect, it could be rheumatoid arthritis very far down on the path. But I wouldn't jump to something like rheumatoid arthritis. Remember, some of the blood tests we do bring anxiety onto patients as well. It's like a female coming to me saying, you know, they've bled in between their period cycle. I'm going to check for ovarian cancer. You know, you would never do that. You know, sadly, there's, there could be that one in five million that could be that case. But you never, you, you, you are sensible. You look for other things first and, and get to it. So similar in this case, I would do my basic screen of the vitamins really, you, you could argue even things like kidney function, liver function, in that case, what is the point? Which is fair. If you're really looking after the resource of the NHS, you could argue there's any point. So I would really go very basic and say things like thyroid and a vitamin screen <clears throat> would be reasonable. 
But I think the way things are now, we are also trying to balance that being trying to be proactive. And we would encourage you to, to do that as well. Proactive meaning is there something a little bit off? If say, for example, um, you you did, you know, you did a blood test and you did FB, FBC, Usenes, LFT, your vitamins um, and thyroid. And just say, for example, yeah, thyroid came back as you suspected because they had a bit of muscle ache, a joint pain. They weren't able to lift their arms. Great, fantastic. Well done. You picked it up on thyroid, which we would have expected. But you did an FBC and their full blood count was seven, which it should be, remember, between 11 and 14. Now, you've done something great there because that could be a cancer. Definitely, definitely, until proven otherwise, you would class that as a cancer because there should be no reason why someone's hemoglobin should be almost half and this is in a male. And then it starts the process. Now you shouldn't over investigate, but that certainly deserves investigation, which is why those doctors or those people that argue, oh, for some, that example that you've given Chris, you know, why did you do full blood count? Why did you liver? Why did you kidney? Well, we're also trying to be proactive. We don't want to get to this place where we're firefighting. So if you're going to the trouble of doing a blood test, do in that case, do your vitamin screen, but I would personally add on some basic bloods, full blood count, liver and kidney um, as part of your screen. <clears throat> that's great, thanks. Can I, can I ask one last question if that's okay? Of course. <clears throat> so a case comes, I mean, when we do the vitamin D screening, uh, they show uh, levels below 23 according to the osteopenia society, below, vitamin, below 23 as osteopenic. Uh, when do you uh, recommend uh, vitamin D, when would you recommend aldronic acid or when would you recommend uh, denosumab injections? So what level are you talking about? The vitamin D level being low or? Yes, the... we have, so osteopor patient being osteoporotic. Uh, you, you said that there is an association between vitamin D level being low and a patient Correct. being osteoporotic. Yes, right, okay, so I, I understand the question. So just to be clear, the vitamin D is one aspect and yes, there are links in terms of it will make the osteoporosis harder to treat if the vitamin D is incorrect. So the way you would do it, you would split it. So say, for example, they were low vitamin D and they have osteoporosis, you'd first quickly focus on the vitamin D. Now, anything below 50 is considered low vitamin D. Anything below 20 is considered severe. So yep. anything below 20, you would actually go high dose um, vitamin D at 20,000 units. And you would be still comfortable to give that while whatever you're going to do with the osteoporosis, because you're not going to overdose. So make sure you treat that. So anything under 20, focus, focus, focus on that low vitamin to get that up. Because remember, as Tim pointed out, it can even cause anxiety and depression, low vitamin D. So really important you get that sorted. So low under 20, get that really high and sorted. Between 20 and 50, where you are low, but not too low, that's where you have this discussion where if they've got osteoporosis, you could give something and it's like a, say it's a medium uh, vitamin D, so 20 to 50, and you have some osteoporosis or osteopenia, you could give Adcal, which contains calcium and vitamin D. Remember that way you're nicely, slowly bringing up your vitamin D from the, 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 the coming up between the 20 to the 50, but also you're also helping the osteoporosis and then you think about um the, the various medications so the um, medications like allodronic acid and so forth that you can use for osteoporosis that's when on a dexa scan you've got a definite full-on positive osteoporosis and if you want to know figures things they say it's, it has to be below minus 2.5 which is the score that you may see the t-score that you see the t-score yes correct if that's below minus 2.5 you should treat this with a bisphosphonate. Thank you. Thank you. Levan, thank you again. Just an amazing um, um, talk on, on, on giving us a better introduction of, of, um, uh, of um, blood tests and what we might look for in blood. Um, uh, any final thoughts before we, 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 we wrap up?
I think we might have lost you, Levan. I'm not sure if you're still there. Oh, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, Levan? Before we um, no. So up? yeah, just um, I'm always here. You know, we all help each other. You guys have helped tremendously for me. So anytime you need kind of sessions or anything like this, if it's usually if it's outside the scope, not just blood tests, but scans even or anything, you know, we can go through it together. You guys are probably better at it, to be honest. But um, you know, that's what we're all here for. We're trying to create a system, aren't we, um, Tim, with this PCMs of all working in one mm. in silent. And then we want to learn, you know, I want you guys to know about blood tests. They're gone are the days where physios shouldn't know blood. You should know blood. I think it's great. And we should understand examinations. I think we're useless at the examinations, but um, you know, I need to find time to to remember, you know, sub sub virus, where that mm. goes, how does that insert? Yeah, we, 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 you know, we, we need to learn. So, so any opportunities we're connecting our teams like this, please grab me. I'm more than happy to help. Um, well, I know we've got 23 people on the, the, the call tonight who will massively get enormous amount of information from this. So thank you so much. And, and we'll share the video as well internally with our, on our intranet so that the, the, so the other guys can catch up if we weren't able to make it tonight. But a massive thank you. And can we please um, return the favour by offering you our expertise with your YouTube channel? Um, wow. So please subscribe, guys. I know a few of you did subscribe after the last, um, after the last um, um, talk, but um, that's... Um, Dr. Levan Baskaran um, on YouTube. Um, please do click the subscribe button. Please do do like a few of his videos. Um, and also, I think um, you know if you'd like us to contribute to any areas of expertise MSK to to for your audience as well. Please do let us know, and as you have done previously. I think you're just very organized. You're just very organized, Tim. I would love that. I just need to organize my troops and get you down. But yeah, no, we'll definitely, I think it'll be a very useful session for all of us. So yeah, we'll do We'll something. just come up to the clinic and we'll just do it. <laughs> <Yeah, I do. laughs> like, just a blast. <laughs> but thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you for all you do. We, we really, really do appreciate it, especially with this FCP stuff. It's, it's genuinely, genuinely, I'm not even lying. It has game changed. Even now we're doing it in Sutton now. It really made a difference. Yeah, amazing. Brilliant. It's so good. Thanks so much, Levan. And we really appreciate it. Take care. Take care, guys. Have a nice evening. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.